Did you know, according to statistics, a crazy 60 to 75% of children walk away from the faith upon high school graduation? I don't know about you, but I am not raising my kids to turn their backs on God the minute that they're out of my house. Now, of course, you can't force your kids to be Christian, and you would never want to. But if you are raising kids that you hope will be Christians, real true Christians, long after they're out of your home, today's podcast is for you. In it, I'm sharing five ways that you can help your kids have a faith that lasts. All right, so before we dive in too far today, I wanna get started with a little bit of a disclaimer. As most of you know, my kids are not grown and gone yet, so I can't speak from the perspective of somebody who has finished raising kids. Um, My kids are nine, five, and three, but what I'm gonna be sharing today is basically what I do, what I've learned so far um, with kids the ages that I have, as well as a lot of the example that I learned from my own mom. My mom is an awesome, amazing Christian lady who set just a fantastic example for me, and I have seen that play out in my own life as somebody who really didn't ever fall away. Um, So I'm gonna share some of that with you too, as well as a lot of things that I have read and studied as I am trying to raise awesome kids myself. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first thing that I wanna talk about is number one, setting a positive example. So as your children's parent, you have an incredible opportunity and responsibility to help decide what is going to be normal for them. In other words, the choices that you make on an everyday, day-to-day basis, the way that you live your life is going to become their normal. And as all of us know, we kind of are creatures of habit. We like to stick to what is normal and comfortable, the things that we've always done. So right now you have an opportunity to decide what normal is gonna be like for your kids. And what I mean by this is, Think about Sunday mornings. What is normal for your family on Sunday mornings? Do you just wake up and go to church and no questions asked because that's what you do? Or is it a thing where on Sunday mornings you're like, should I go to church? I don't really feel like it. I have errands. I need to clean the house. And you make excuses. Whatever you do on a daily basis is going to become your children's normal. Here in our house on Sunday mornings, my kids don't wake up and say, hey, are we going to church or not? Because they know we're going to church. It's Sundays. That's what you do on Sundays. And obviously you should go because you love it too. But just setting it up first as a normal thing on Sundays, we go to church, creates that habit in them and just creates that sense of this is normal, this is what we do that can kind of help start those good habits as they grow up. Um, Another thing is reading the Bible. Is it normal in your house for people to read the Bible or is that something that's not really done? Um, As you have your kids grow up, they're going to have a perception of what it means to read the Bible. Are they going to say, oh, that's something you should do, but no one actually does it? Or are they going to say, oh yeah, I totally know how to read the Bible. That's very normal to me. I saw my mom reading the Bible every day. Like that's what Christians do. We read the Bible. What is normal for them? Um, I have no problem with people who wake up super early. I think that's great and awesome on self-discipline to be able to wake up really early and read your Bible before your kids wake up, especially if you have little ones that make it hard to concentrate. Um, But for me, it's always been important that I read my Bible with my kids around. It is a little bit more difficult, but I want them to see me in the Word. I want them to have that as their normal, that they say, oh yeah, the Bible, we know how to read that. We saw our mom read that all the time. And I try to make an effort to read a paper Bible when they're around and not just read it on my phone um, because they don't know if I'm just scrolling on my phone, you know, I'm probably on Facebook. Like I want them to see, yes, my mom was in the word all the time. My mom knew her Bible and that would be their normal, that they would read the Bible. Obviously my kids are a little bit little to read it themselves, um, but my nine-year-old does sometimes go and read his Bible. And it's not this big, crazy, intimidating thing for him because it's something that's always been normal. We have read it together. Um, Your kids can see you read the Bible. You can read the Bible with them. At night, when you do bedtime stories, instead of reading, you know, always choosing whatever trade book that is out right now, like Frog and Toad or elephant and piggy. We love those books too. But adding Bible stories into the rotation just so that they get used to reading in the Bible is normal. It's not this big thing. You just read the Bible. Um, And I want that to be something that's normal for my kids as well. Um, Another thing is how you respond to people who need help. So do you um, tithe at church? Is that normal in your family or is that something that you don't do? Um, When you're at the checkout and they say, hey, would you like to give more money for whatever? 
Is that normal in your family? Is that something that you do? Or is that something that you don't do? And when your kids are little, it doesn't really matter what the entire rest of the world does because they don't know what the rest of the world does. But they see what you do and that becomes their normal. Um, they see the way that you speak to your husband. Um, they see the way you treat your children. They see the way that you talk to your friends on the phone. Um, they see the things you worry about. They see when you get upset and when you relax and when you trust God. And they see what that looks like for you, whether you realize it or not. So the choices that you're making every day are absolutely setting what is normal for them. So the very first thing you can do before you even worry about teaching your child or telling your child or trying to impart these life lessons is just to work on yourself and growing your own faith and setting that positive example that your kids need to see in order to be able to learn. This is something that my own mom did a really great job of. I saw her every day when times were tough. She was in the Bible. I saw her when times were tough. She was praying and I saw her do this. She didn't do it for me. She did it for herself. Um, but that was even better because it wasn't something she was teaching. It was just something she was doing. And I saw that model and I saw what it looked like. And that became normal for me. And it wasn't this like scary thing or this like supposed to thing. It was just what you do. Um, you go to church. You serve at church. Um, another thing, are you involved at church? Do you help out with any ministries at church? Do you have any volunteer opportunities outside of church? Um, when there comes an opportunity at your kid's school where they need volunteers, are you looking for ways to get involved or are you looking for ways to get out of it? Um, and obviously no one person can do everything and that's not the point at all. Um, but just your attitude towards things. Are you seeking God? Are you chasing after him? Are you living a life that's showing that? Are you showing your kids, you learning and trying and, tr you know, trying to be an awesome Christian, then they're going to pick up on that and that's going to be their normal. Or is your life just pretty much the same as anybody else in the world? Well, then that's going to be their normal too. So just keeping that in mind first and foremost, so that you are working on yourself. You're the only person you have control over, but really working on your relationship and being that person that when your kids grow up, what kind of Christian do you want them to be? How do you want them to turn out? Well, it starts with you first being that Christian yourself to set them that positive example. All right, number two, the second thing you want to do is have intentional conversations. So while it's super important that you start by setting a positive example, you can't just stop there. It's not enough to just show your children how to behave. You have to actually tell them and teach them as well with words. And there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, the first reason is because they might not pick up on or notice everything that you are doing. So you might be, you know, purposely showing your husband so much respect and your kids just don't even notice. Or if they do notice, they don't really know why. Um, at this point, they're still children. They, you know, don't pick up on all of it on their own. So making sure that they notice and they see why um, so they can remember and learn a little bit more. And secondly, because not everything that your kids are going to face in life, you're, you're not going to be able to model all of it for them when they're kids. There are lots of issues and situations that are never just going to come up on their own. So that's why you want to, any chance you have, um, try to put those intentional conversations into your day-to-day -day language. It doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be this whole big thing, but just whenever an opportunity arises that you can talk about some of these kinds of things. So let me give you a few concrete examples of what this might look like just to help you think. So one thing that happens every December is when we go into stores is we see the people with the Salvation Army buckets out. And every time we see them, I have a choice. Um, you can either talk about them or not talk about them. So for us, that's something that we have done in the past just to make sure that my kids know, like each of them as they get old enough to understand, um, when we see people with Salvation Army buckets out, we can talk about, okay, here's who these people are, here's why they're out there, and you know, a little bit of in kid-friendly language, like here's what's going on. Like it's something we see to be a conversation prompt. So I might tell my kids something like, oh, these are volunteers. They're just normal people who are giving up some of their time because they want to help other people. And the money goes to people who don't have homes or they don't, you know, they don't have the things that they need um, in order to live a good life. Like we are really lucky and we are really blessed that we have a warm home and we have um, food on our tables and we have warm coats, but not everybody has those. And some people actually don't have a house. They live outside. So that's why it's so important for us who have a little bit of extra to give some of that extra that we have to other people who don't have that, who need some help. Um, and that is just a really kid friendly way, super basic to explain um, because kids need to know because if you shield your kids from all the bad things in the world, like they can't help if they don't know. And I want to raise kids 
from the gate who know like there are things in the world that aren't good, but we have the power to help and we can help. And maybe we can't do all the things, um, but we can do something. And I want to raise kids who say, hey, if I can't do everything, I can do something. What can I do? How can I help even in a small way? And that starts with me having that conversation with them first. Like, hey, here's what's going on. How can we help in a small way? So that's just one example, like putting money in the Salvation Army buckets or like Angel Tree. If your um, church does something like Angel Tree, or like the toys for tots um, around Christmas time where you can donate things like seeing those as a prompt to say hey did you know some kids don't have toys or they don't have these things or their parents made bad choices and they had to go to prison and they don't have a daddy there with them every day or a mommy there with them every day but you know what's something nice you know will you come with me and help pick out a toy for somebody else and just giving them these opportunities because your children don't have these opportunities on their own um, but to intentionally create these opportunities and these chances um, to say, hey, here's what's going on. What can we do about it? And involve your kids in the brainstorming and you know, teaching them, hey, if you can't do everything, you can do something. Let's do something. Um, donating to um, my kids' school is really great about they do all kinds of drives, um, fundraisers for like a coat drive or a canned food drive. Um, and when those things happen, that's an opportunity to have conversations about you know, other people have lives that are different. Not everybody, you know, has the same things and we want to help out of what we have. And just, that's another modeling thing. Like what's your attitude when you're helping? Are you like, oh my goodness, I forgot, bare minimum, here's like a can of something. Or like, oh yeah, how can we bless these people? What can we do? Um, so that's just an opportunity to have more intentional conversations. Um, another thing you can talk about as you're having these conversations is just the fact that some people make different life choices than you do. For example, if you're watching the news, it's really easy to want to shield your kids away from that and to say, oh, this isn't appropriate for kids, you know, go away. Um, but it's a really good opportunity to have some conversations to teach your kids, hey, there are real things going on in the world that aren't good and we can talk about them in a kid-friendly way um, so that you can understand here's what's going on. Um, for example, if there's like a pride parade in your area, it's really easy to just like, no, you kids don't need to know about that. But once once they're old enough to start having those conversations, um, to say, hey, not everybody believes the same things we do, and to let them learn about it from a Christian parent, not from the world. But to say, hey, here's what some people believe, and here's what we believe, and here's why. Um, and then you're also teaching them how to respond to people who believe differently than you when you see people who are making other choices, um, especially and new abortion bill passed lately. That was a pretty big, huge thing. You know, are your kids hearing you talk about this? Are you having conversations um, about this? And what kind of conversations are you having? Are you saying, oh my goodness, what terrible people? How could they? What awful people? Who would do these things? Or are you saying, you know, this is so sad that people are in this situation um, and, you know, I feel for them. I care about them. How can I help? Or are you just like judging and being rude and shameful for them? Obviously, there are things that are sin, absolutely. But what kind of conversations are you having around these things? What kind of things are you teaching your children um, so that you're teaching them more of a posture and attitude of how can I help rather than uh, you deserve to be in that situation. Um, other conversations that we've had in our family. So a lot of you know my backstory about how I was raised Protestant and I married my husband who is Catholic um, and I have not converted. I um, am still doing a lot of research on the Catholic Church but I'm not Catholic myself um, but we're raising our kids Catholic. So I have not yet told my nine-year-old that I am not Catholic. He does not know this yet. I'm kind of procrastinating on that conversation just because I don't want to cause a bunch of confusion there. Um, but we have had conversations about people believe different things. Um, I've even, last weekend I got out stacks of Bibles and I was like, hey, let's look at the difference between these Bibles so that he knows, um, you know, Catholics believe a little bit different than other people. Um, but then it also gives him an opportunity of, you know, how do we talk about people who believe differently than us, even though he doesn't realize that's his mom yet. Um, but how do we talk about people who, do, who believe a little bit differently than us? And, you know, to say, you know, we can still be respectful for people. We can still say, hey, there is one truth. And we had this conversation also. There is one truth, but not everybody agrees on what it could possibly be. And, you know, we have to be humble because we can't say, oh, I know for sure. Um, but having these conversations about what other people believe and why and why we believe what we do, um, that's another thing that it's really important to have conversations with your kids about what you believe and why. Because a lot of the reason, I think a lot of the reason why kids are falling away from the faith is because they're not getting um, what's known as Christian apologetics at home. So apologetics or from the church, um, apologetics is basically the study of what we believe and why. Um, so for example, we believe that 
Christ came to earth and was born a virgin birth and died for our sins, etc. Um, I'm sure you know the gospel. Um, but we believe a lot of things in the Christian faith. But as the kids go out into the world, they're going to encounter, encounter a lot of people who don't believe the same thing, who have really strong arguments, who can say, oh, how could you possibly believe that? Because don't you know the Bible says this? And, you know, don't you know this? And this is totally at odds with science. And how can you believe this? And if you're not having those conversations with your kids when they are under your roof, they're not going to know how to have these conversations once they're out of your home. So it's so important that you're having these conversations. And I know that those are really difficult if you are not yourself really sure on what you believe. Um, I did want to mention, just because this is a book I have that I think is really helpful, there is a book by Natasha Crane. I love her as an author, but she wrote the book, and there's another one just like it too. Um, but this one is Talking With Your Kids About God, and it is 30 Conversations Every Christian Parent Must Have. You can get it anywhere. You can get it on Amazon. I'll link it in the show notes below as well. Um, but this has 30 conversations, like all kinds of things about creation and holiness and Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood. And I'm just kind of like skimming through it at this point. But there's so like it's really well written for whatever age of kids that you have to be able to say, hey, here's what we believe and here's why. Um, here's the proofs for it. Not that you can 100% prove it, but there is data behind Christianity. We don't just believe it because we feel like it. There are real reasons why we believe what we believe. So having those conversations with your kids so that once they go out into the real world, that they're prepared because they've already had these conversations at home with their parents who are Christians who love them rather than somebody who's in their face ridiculing them and saying, how can you possibly believe that? You know, that's so old, so old fashioned, don't you know the Bible says. Um, so preparing them so that they're ready for that is so important, which leads us into point number three, be open to questions. So I am not around as many Christians who are like this as much anymore as I have been in the past. Um, but I know that there are a lot of Christians out there who are very skeptical of questions, who say, oh, well, you shouldn't question the Bible. Oh, you shouldn't question God. You shouldn't, you know, just believe it. It's true. Like, how could you, you know, question this? Um, but that is very dangerous to kids because if you are not teaching them to question and you are not teaching them that it's okay to have questions. Someday when they do have questions, because we're going to, they're not going to know how to handle that. They're not going to know what to do with that. Um, and it's best for them to have these questions and to get the answers that they need in your home, um, under your roof and under you being able to teach them and look up the answers with them, rather than just sending them out saying, well, you just need to believe what it is. Um, this is something that's really important to me, especially because I was raised in a very legalistic small church where we were taught one way. And it was only once I grew up and I started reading the Bible for myself, um, how I mentioned before, my husband is Catholic and I was talking to his mom and she was saying, oh, well, why do you believe these things that are different than what we believe? Just very politely, like, you know, why, how are we getting this different when we read the same Bible? And when I went in to read the Bible, I realized so much of what I had been taught was not correct. And that's why I am so passionate about getting in the word, finding out what it says. If you have a question or um, just not straight up believing whoever tells you what, because what if they got it wrong? And I would hate for my kids to learn something from Sunday school or from some teacher who got it wrong and had a misconception. They just didn't know. Um, I'm not even saying that they were maliciously like teaching the wrong thing, but they just got it wrong somehow. I don't want my kids to just that's how it is. I want my kids to be able to question things and to be able to know how to look up things. And that also leads into like, it's okay if you don't know all the answers, that's fine. Go look it up together, but create a culture in your family where you can say, Hey, we don't know everything. It's okay to not know everything. We're going to look up what we can. Um, and you have to trust in faith for some of it, but it's okay to have questions. It's okay to wonder about things. Um, and let's look them up and let's find out together. And having this faith that is a relationship that's a learning experience that's more of like an adventure like i don't know i think of my faith as really exciting like i get to learn more and if i don't know things i can go look them up and i can learn more about god and i can learn more about what it means to be a christian and it's not just this like static in a box that somebody handed to me and was like here is what you have here is a box it is square and it is this is what it is and rigid like no like this is a relationship with God that is handed on and it's going to look a little different for every person, but it's okay to question and it's okay to wonder because that means you care and that means you're looking into things. And even for a lot of you as an adult, if there are things that you are struggling with, it is fine. Um, it's fine to have questions. It means you care and then go look up the answers. Um, 
and figure out and that's cool and you'll never know everything and your kids don't need to know everything and if they you know and that's something that they need to learn too like it's okay to not know everything you want to know as much as you can and you want to be learning it's okay to not know everything it's okay to have questions it's okay to struggle it's okay to find passages in the bible where you're like i don't know how that is in there um because there are a lot of them and that's okay and it's better for your kids to realize that when they're at home with you to talk about those parts that you struggle with to talk about the things that you struggle with as an adult even you're like the bible says this and i'm struggling um in an age appropriate way but it, you know be open to those questions be okay with not knowing be okay with learning um and that's going to set your kids up for success too so that they don't feel like oh they failed or oh they can't believe because they have a question like it's okay we all have questions there's all things that we're learning which also leads us right into point number four you'll also really want to gather a supportive community around yourself by this what i mean is it's awesome that you can impart your faith to your kids and obviously some of us have non-Christians in our family, but you are going to want to make sure that you can surround your kids with awesome, strong Christians who are going to be able to provide that amazing example for them and to teach them things that you might not be able to. Um, because each of us, we've only gone through so many things, like we don't know everything. There's always things that we're not gonna have the answers to. Um, and there might get a point when your kids become teenagers or young adults um, where they, can't come to you about things or feel like they can't come to you. Um, they know that what they're doing is wrong or they have a question. They know you're not going to approve like their kids. It happens. Um, you want to be there for them as much as you can, but sometimes there might be a time where they need somebody else. And I want my kids to have that. I talked about this a little bit with Lee Nienheis in the, um, previous podcast interview about raising brave world changing kids. That's a good one. If you haven't seen that one yet. Um, but she talked about having that supportive like tribe around you so that if your kids um, can't talk to you, then they have another really good adult that they can talk to somebody else that they can look up to. And even if they can look up to you, um, just having all those extra people. So it's not just like my mom's crazy because she loves Jesus and nobody else does, but Hey, here is this whole community around us of people who love Jesus. And it looks a little different and everyone has different knowledge and everyone has different opinions, but we're all following God together. Um, and that is just creates a stronger sense of this is our normal. This is what we do because everybody likes to fit in. Nobody wants to stick out and be a weirdo. Um, so having those people around you who can provide more of an excellent example of this is what it looks like in this situation that your parent didn't face, but you know, I'm facing um, just to have them ar around them, um, encouraging your kids to have really good Christian friends talking to them. That's another intentional conversation. Say, you know, who are your friends? Are they good influences on you? Are they people who are making good choices? Are they someone who is going to lead a life that you want your life to be similar to theirs? Because your friends have a crazy amount of influence and there's statistics on that too. Like the people you surround yourself with have a crazy amount of influence on what your life is like. So are you surrounding your kids with positive influences? Are you helping them to find good friends? Are you yourself having good godly friends are you bringing them over to your house are you you know just whoever you can are you having your kids go to a really good church or is their youth group pretty not a good youth group um some are a lot better than others so are you providing them with those role models and those examples um and anything you can do to surround them with a supportive community and even outside of real people like things like we live in a day and age where the media that we consume also is part of our community. Um, they're not people in real life, but what are you watching on TV? Um, again, that's not real life community, but if you are constantly watching things on TV that don't really match the Christian worldview, that is becoming normal for your children. Or are you filling your TV and your home with things that set a good example? What kinds of things are you watching on social media? What kind of music are you listening to in the car? Like what kind of culture are you creating around yourself, both with the people that you know and just the things that you have around yourself? Um, what are you teaching your children? It's just so important to keep that in mind um, so that you're doing everything that you can do as a Christian to be a good Christian yourself um, and then to give your kids everything that 
you need that they need from you as well and obviously you can't do it all but you're doing what you can and then you're bringing others around you who can help you out as well because um, parenting is not easy and the more help and people you have around you the better which leads us into our last point the fifth thing you can do is basically entrust your kids to God as a mother I want my kids to love Jesus I want them to be good people I want them to make good choices I want them to have all the things because I'm their mom and I love them and I want to take care of them and I want to help them and rescue them sometimes and do things for them way more often than I should. Um, I just do. And I want to protect them and help them. And But at the end of the day, I'm only one person. Like I'm their mom. That's a pretty important person to them. But I'm just one person. I can't be there with them all the time. I can't be there when they're at school. I can't be there when they go to a church class that's different from where I'm at. I can't be there when they're at their friend's house. I can't be there more and more as they're growing up, I can't always be there. So I can't always make their decisions for them. I can't do all the things. And there comes a point where we have to learn as parents to entrust our children to God to say, hey, I did my best, or you know, I'm going to do my best in the time that I have left. You know, I'm gonna do what I can, but I can only do so much. But thankfully there is a God, a real God who is a person who is relational, who cares about your children just as much as you do more. He cares about your kids. He loves your kids even more than you do. As much as you want to keep your kids safe, as much as you want to make your kids happy and healthy, there is a God out there who loves your kids, who wants him to, to wants to have a relationship with him, them even more than you do. So at the end of the day, it's doing you, what you can and then entrusting God to take over the rest. I've actually started praying, not every night, but a lot of nights um, as I'm going to sleep and like my kids when I'm awake, I can keep an eye on them and I know like where they are and what they're doing. Um, but once I go to sleep at night, like I'm asleep, I'm in a different room. I'm not right there with them. This is probably me worrying too much. Um, but I've started at night when I go to bed some nights being like, okay, God, I have done what I can today. You know, I need to go to sleep. I need to go be somewhere else now. God, please watch over them while I can't. And I know that this is a prayer I'm going to pray even more once, like right now, like my three-year-old literally is only separated from me pretty much at nap time. Um, but as they grow and as they're away from me more, I know it's a prayer I'm going to pray more and more. God, Watch over them when I can't. God, influence them in ways that I can't. God, convict them in ways that's not my responsibility to do. And, you know, God, bring them these things and provide for them in ways that I can't. Because there's only so much I can do. But God can. God can take care of them. God can influence them. God can lead them and draw them into himself. And he can do all these things that we can't. So as a person, as their mama, I'm going to do everything I can to love these kids and to help them love each other and love God. And we pray for this every night when we do our prayers. When I do their prayers, sometimes their dad does their prayers and they do their own prayers. But when I pray with them, you know, every day it's God, help us to love you. Help us to love others that we're praying every day. Um, and I'll do my part. But at the end of the day, I have to trust God in prayer and come to him in prayer and say, hey, God, I have done my part. I've done my best. Please cover for the mistakes I've made. Please cover for all the ways I am lacking. Please be there when I cannot be there. And just trusting, you know, they're not going to turn out perfect because they're humans. And, you know, there's things, you know, I've made mistakes in my life. I'm sure you've made mistakes in your life. And we're all going to make mistakes. I don't expect my kids to be perfect. Um, but God, protect them, keep them, you know, draw them, do all the things um, to make them these amazing Christian kids that I want them to be as they grow into amazing Christian adults that I really hope they will become. So hopefully these five things were in any way helpful for you. This is what I'm doing with my kids. This is my best advice for you as you are trying to raise good Christian kids. Let me run through them again really fast. First one was set a positive example so your kids see what normal should be. Second was having those intentional conversations. So you're talking about things. So you're talking through everything with them and things that they might not see as an example on their own, you're explaining to them. Third, being open to the questions that they have and creating an atmosphere where questions are okay and we're going to dive in and we're going to learn more and we don't know everything and that's fine. It's fine to struggle with things. It's fine to wrestle with things, but we take it to the word and we see what it says. Fourth is gather a supportive community. So you are not the only awesome influence on your kids, but you have so many people around you, both in real life and in the media that you consume and the books that you read that are providing 
more of an awesome example for your kids. And then fifth of all is to entrust them to God in prayer, knowing that God loves your kids just as much as you do way more and that he's going to take care of them when you can't because you can only do so much. So hopefully this has been helpful for you as well. If you want to dive into this topic even more, I would love for you to check out the show notes. I have a few articles that I am going to link down there. I'm going to link this talking about talking with your kids about God in the show notes as well. Also, another book that is really good is Raising World Changers in a Changing World by Christian Welch. I love her blog. Um, this is another one I have that was really good. I'll link that in the show notes below just so you have all the resources to kind of get started on this journey. Um, there's another one, Sticky Faith, I read a long time ago. I'll find the link for that as well. But anyway, so that you have some resources that you need because you're not going to do perfect, but you can start diving into these resources and doing the best that you can because honestly, as a parent, there is nothing, nothing more important that you can do than to lead your kids to God. So hopefully these will help you do just that. And don't forget, if you are not subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, please go ahead and do that. I come back every, it's about every other week at this minute totally fine. Um, but I come back regularly to bring you all kinds of interviews and encouraging content to help you see what it means to be a amazing Christian woman, to give you that example, to give you all the best knowledge I can come up with. Um, and you're not going to want to miss out because I'm sharing all kinds of things that are really going to help you. So go ahead and subscribe. If you have not already, check out the show notes for additional resources. And I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day and I will see you back here again real soon. All right. Bye.